So there's this idea that drives a lot of scholarship and popular culture, uh, that there are two kinds of time, wartime and peacetime, and history consists of moving from one to the next, from wartime to peacetime to wartime. Thinking about it that way, wartime is, by definition, temporary. Um, it's in part because wartime is temporary that wartime by itself becomes an argument about things. So we think of basically security being enhanced during wartime, rights being enhanced during peacetime. And so if rights get restricted during wartime, well, wartime is always followed by peacetime. So wartime is by definition temporary. And so don't worry so much about the expanse of government power during war or rights restrictions during war because wartime always goes away. And so the at least conceptualization is uh, those harsh government policies will get eclipsed once we move out of wartime and into peacetime. But of course, when you look at the broader expanse of American war, the 20th century ends up looking kind of like the way we have been thinking about the 21st century. What we see is ongoing military conflict. And at least right now, it's hard to imagine where the ending to this is. So the, if the idea is wartime is always followed by peacetime, and so we're always going to have the pendulum swinging back and rights protection coming back, well, how is that going to happen when what we have is a period of ongoing, endless war? So American history is, uh, when, we th when we think about the impact of war or wartime on civil liberties or other important features of American history, um, scholars tend to think about the big wars um, and not remember all the small wars that happen along the way. So the history of American wartime is often remembered as, for example, 20th century, World War I, World War II, maybe Korea as some aspect of the Cold War, whatever that is. Um, and you know, th those are the major wars of the 20th century that are thought to affect rights, affect the scope of presidential power, et cetera. Um, but that's not all of American wartime. Um, and if you look at, for example, I use US military campaign service medals. Um, which are given out to soldiers just as a recognition of their honorable service during American military conflicts. And when you plot that on a timeline for the 20th century, it's really hard to find anything that you'd call a peacetime because we have been consistently engaged in military a um, action overseas somewhere or another across the entire century. One of the most pressing problems with ongoing military conflict and the character of contemporary ongoing military conflict is its impact on presidential power uh, and the atrophy of political restraints on presidential power. Um, one thing that we see now is basically the American people over time have been distanced from the direct experience of war. If you compare contemporary um, circumstances with World War II. During World War II, it's, it's not just that there was a big war and so everybody paid attention to it, but also there was a big war and the U.S. government promoted engagement and attention and service in that conflict, right? So that you know, the, the Roosevelt administration thought it needed public engagement and so it basically marketed the war to the American people and required their participation uh, in various kinds of ways um, and encourage their participation. You know, for example, the, the, the uh, income tax was expanded to a mass tax in World War II. That was one way of engaging everyone in some level of service and sacrifice for the war. Um, nowadays, most Americans don't think about war. It happens somewhere else. It doesn't involve them their family members aren't serving, um, the war's not happening in their neighborhood, 
they feel completely disaffected and, and untouched by it, and they just as soon watch a TV show, right? Rather than being engaged in their country's use of force, um, the, with, you know, involving the use of military force, um, which is the brutal practice of killing, right? And so what we do is we ask a small number of American citizens uh, to do the work for the rest of the country, uh, to be actively engaged in what national leaders think are important defense activities, and the rest of us are, are simply isolated from, from that. So this has an impact on American democracy that's really important in that the only meaningful restraints on political war power, on presidential war power, are political restraints. It comes from the people, it comes from political engagement. And we saw this at the end of the Vietnam War, when in part because of the draft, um, Americans were out in the streets uh, basically saying, bring this war to an end, you know, let's get out of Southeast Asia. And it was that widespread protest that put political pressure that led Lyndon Johnson to have to, you know, not run, not, not run for re-election. And it actually, according to scholars of the Nixon administration, put limits on what President Nixon thought he could do. Um, so essentially, the, the, the people created, through their action, political restraints on presidential war power. Now that we have, you know, such a disconnect between the American people and you know, the practice of American war, you've got no engagement. You've got no, on some level, when we go to the polls and people are voting for presidents, very little interest about military matters. And that simply increases the ability of the president to go it alone, to set the policy, to, uh, to it, it enhances presidential unilateralism. Yeah, the media has always been tremendously important um, in war, and one of the ways we see this is in the way that um, presidents have worked either with or against the media, understanding that the public um, understanding of war and public engagement with war, um, or, or, or the public letting the government do what it wants to do, you know, that that's tremendously important. Um, so in World War I, there was censorship uh, of the media. Uh, in World War II, the uh, FDR created the Office of War Information and basically managed information. Uh, so there was a combination of s censorship and engagement, um, you know, getting the press involved in, hopefully from the FDR administration, telling the story in a way that was favorable. Um, then in Vietnam, we had a mix of things. Um, and reporting on the war, especially when reporters were able to get in on the ground level in Vietnam, um, once we started, uh, the American people started seeing you know, reports about difficulties in the Vietnam War, that helped inform the American people in a way that helped lead to the pushback from the war in Vietnam. So the media plays a tremendously important role. Um, political scientists argue that the way we understand war is affected by um, not just what's happening out there. How do Americans know what's happening out there? They learn it in part from the media. So Americans come to have opinions about war uh, filtered through elite discourse and partisan politics. Um, and so the media plays a tremendously important role in, in providing the, the narratives of war and the sort of messages about war um, to the American people. And to the extent that the media has been able to be an independent voice, um, that's played an important role in allowing our political system to work, in allowing there to be meaningful democratic engagement um, during uh, different war eras.